Is mic source working? All right. We're back and we're live. Not to uh, to harp on it too much because it's already said in the main service, but for anybody that's watching and for us here, uh, Jared's class will be this coming Tuesday. Me and him are going to meet over here on Monday to uh, finalize the rest of the preparations. The lapel mic that the church ordered still hasn't come yet. The latest delivery date is going to be Tuesday. So... If it comes when they say it come will come it will come under the wire. I think it will come tomorrow. A lot of stuff they've been estimating further out than it actual actual delivery date. So um, hopefully we will do a dry run of the system tomorrow. If anybody's watching, you see a stream pop up on your feed. That is probably me and Jarrett testing everything and making sure it's all going good. We've got the uh, projector thing straightened out. We know what we're doing there, and uh, it will all be done soon. This is gonna. I, this is going to be a good thing, and Brother Larry said if nobody shows up, we shouldn't have, but there's, I bet there'll be a lot of people watching. Uh, I, I, you know, for, uh, there's, uh, there's, al there's always an audience out there, I, and, and I, for, for those of you that teach or preach and think that you're not getting out to that many people, just remember there's always an audience out there, um, and uh, this might not be, this it's not well. I know. I know. I know. The Lord saw it come, but when it, when the when the writers of the of the New Testament were like Paul were writing, I, I doubt they ever envisioned anything like this being the way that we would evangelize. But here we are, and we're gonna we're gonna take advantage of it. Everybody else says we might as well too. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to uh, go into uh, pretty some pretty familiar stuff, um, but uh, it's going to be part two of our Out of Context series that we're doing. Um, and we're going to talk about John 3, a very infamous chapter that contains an even more infamous verse um, that a lot of people take, and I wouldn't even say when you talk about talking out of context, um, that we necessarily take it out of context, but a lot of people do. A lot of people take it to mean something totally different. So if we'll go to chapter to verse 16, let's just read the verse. Sans anything else. The, the way that a lot of, I won't even say a lot of other religions, but a, a lot of other brands of Christianity would probably publicize this verse, whether it be on a business card or on a banner or something like that, completely sans anything else uh, that is related to the rest of this chapter. Verse 16 reads, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A lot of people will take this to mean that anybody, and I do mean anyone, from disregarding election completely, that anybody that believes on Jesus will be saved. Um... We're not all promised heaven. Uh, and the whosoever that's being used here is being used completely, if you take it at its face, and, and this is where I, I get again, I, I really have a problem with the idea of not investigating the languages that this book was written in, because if you don't, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um even, I will even go as far as say this, 1611 English is not your English. It's not even old world English. I, I, was, I was watching something the other day and an American guy was talking to a, a British guy. And, and the craziest thing, you know over in Great Britain, PB&J is not a thing. Nobody eats peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. In fact, the guy that was that was talk that the 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 British guy that was talking to, that, that he was talking to tried one on the stream that I was like and said that it tasted it felt weird in his mouth. Now, that type of cultural dissonance between America and even Great Britain, think about how far your language has fallen from then. And I think we do ourselves a great disservice by not investigating. It, 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 and I'll tell you what it is. It's laziness because there, it, it shows a lack of study. It shows a, 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 a lack of your ability to do, the, do your homework to know what you're talking about. So let's go to the top of chapter 3, and let's get let's roll up our sleeves and get digging. Now, I'm going to present a couple of topics, and, and I think we, we talked about out of context in the last lesson. 
um, kind of sans any way to figure out context. I said, you, you know, sometimes you have to read entire chapters before you can get the context or something. But I, I, I think there's some other guidelines that we can follow, both when we're trying to find contextual clues for a verse, but also just regular study. So let's begin. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. When it comes to reading in context, there are some things that we need to point out. First of all, who is being talked to is important. A lot of times, if you look in the Old Testament, it's Israel. It is Israel as a nation body. Not always, though. Look at uh, look at uh, the message that Isaiah had for, or not, not Isaiah. What am I talking about? That um, why am I drawing a blank on his name? The the prophet that was in David's time. Um, that that thou art the man, Nathan. Thank you. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on that. That Nathan the prophet. Uh, that the the that was not for Israel at large. That was a very direct and poignant message at one man. In fact, it was so very poignant that the parable that Nathan told had to be explained in graphic detail for David. Um. So whenever we are looking for contextual clues of what we're talking about, who you're talking to is so important, whether it's a group, it, are they talking to a church? Look at your church letters. Their, their address, most of those church letters are addressing an entire group, an entire assembly of people, but there are there are parts of those letters, and you have to watch this as you're reading through a church letter. Sometimes they're focused on, on, an, on an individual group within the church. And knowing who you're talking to is very important whenever you're talking about, well, why does this a message apply to everybody? The message probably does not apply to everybody because it's not everybody that's who being, who's being talked to. Here we're talking to Nicodemus. What is what and who was Nicodemus? He is described very very uh, easily at the top of the verse. He is a Pharisee, which was a sect of the of the uh, the, the ruling. I don't know if ruling classes, but the, is the right term. But the uh, but the uh, religious elitists of of Jesus' time that specifically believed in resurrection. There was another sect called the Sadducees that believed in no resurrection, and that was their big dividing point. And then the scribes, which were basically... Um, me and Jarrett were talking about this last week. They're, they're the, they're, they're, they, were, they, were both, they were the copiers, they were the writers, but they were also probably the people that says, well, the Bible actually doesn't say that. They were, they were those people. Uh, they were they were they were the ones that could point to you uh, verse and text and dot and apostrophe and tilde and whatever else you wanted to throw on it. They could tell you those things. It's not actually what it says. Actually, this means that those were your scribes. So he was a Pharisee when that he was a Jew. And when we're addressing Jews, a lot of the rules that apply to us don't apply. A lot of the things that you think about when you talk about us don't apply. When we're, when we're focusing toward Israel, when we're focusing toward the Jew, because they have had in the past a very specific relationship with God that we have not had. Their nation was the, ch was the chosen people ahead of us. Way ahead of us. For that, and this is a terrible thought, but for thousands and thousands of years, Gentiles lived, they were born, and they died, and they went straight to hell. And that is that is the, the point of it, because God had one chosen people, and I'm not even so certain all those people within his chosen people were his people. It's almost like I don't think all the, the, of the bride of Christ are, all the church is the bride of Christ. I don't think that you're going to get all that there. All right, so let's, let's, let's continue. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Now, who is the second person that we're talking about in this? This is Jesus. When, when we're talking about Jesus, everything that he's fixing to say is super important. I know the entire word of God is inspired, but whenever I see words in red, i.e. things that my Lord said, they are the paramount, most important parts of that chapter. Why? Because it is him physically talking to us. We don't get that a lot in the scriptures. We get a lot of men inspired by God to write, but we don't get Jesus's and and by by extension of him being a member of the Godhead, God's point of view 
on a lot of things. So we have these two players, and he comes with a level of flattery. Now, and, and, and I don't think this was over flirta- uh, 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 I don't know if flirtatious is the right word, uh, but this is uh, there, there wasn't a lot of flattery in this because being a Jew, being a learned Jew, Nicodemus was using uh, his um, past knowledge of the Scripture. Jesus was performing miracles. Miracles were performed by prophets. Elijah, Elisha. He wasn't giving Jesus anything more than that was due any other prophet. In fact, he calls him rabbi, which means what in Hebrew? Teacher, right. He's, 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 he is he is a he wasn't he he was giving him the equivalency of his PhD that level of regard because Jesus was a very learned man in the scriptures in fact he was so learned that he he was confounding and discoursing with uh, the religious elite of his day at twelve years old uh, <laughs> in the in the temple uh, to continue Jesus said unto him. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus takes this flattery, and he knuckles down to the point of why Nicodemus was there. See, Nicodemus, and again, important important part of context, what time of day is it? This is, it's at night. Nicodemus didn't want anybody to know. You don't do things by night that you necessarily want people to see during the day. Uh, you know, I, I I have some very old ragged pajamas that I would not be seen I would not be seen dead in. But in the in the dead of night, if Sarah needs me to run garbage out to the garbage can, I'll do it in the dead. We don't have any street light. Nobody can see me. Nobody, and, and I'll run that garbage bag out there. Nobody. It doesn't matter that I'm wearing you know a plaid uh, plaid plaid pajama bottoms and and and, and, and old t shirt that's probably got three holes in it. Nobody cares. But I wouldn't be caught dead in the daylight with those on. And Nicodemus wouldn't be caught dead discoursing this matter with the Lord, which is what? His never dying soul. Nicodemus didn't even ask about that, but Jesus knew why he was there because Jesus responded to all his flattery with, why are you really here, Nicodemus? That's essentially what this statement was. Let's get down to brass tacks. You're not here to butter me up. You're here to ask me some very specific questions, and we're going to dig into them. And that's basically what verse 3 was. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now this is can be taken two ways that he was performing. I forget what the Latin is there. Uh, but there's a, there's a phrase that means that you're taking an idea to the furthest and most illogical point and then and then criticizing that that uh, the ridiculous results that you can push that to. Basically, Nicodemus says, I'm a full-grown man. Am I going to climb back inside my mom and be born again? That's ridiculous, Jesus. And, and that's one way of taking this. Also, you have to remember, we know about a second birth, a spiritual birth. Nicodemus had no clue. Jesus was saying, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus was like, excuse me? <laughs> uh, am, am I hearing you correctly, sir? Um, and Jesus answered, said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Now, Jesus is outlining what he's talking about. You have to be born of your flesh. You have to. You have to be a living human being. <laughs> And you have to have had that touch with God. In my Bible, and it's very interesting that we brought this up, say, in my Bible, the Spirit there is capital S Spirit. Uh, I, don't, I don't know about Brother Larry's Bible, which seems to be uh, tied to a, a great deal of heresy. Uh, but uh, um, uh, capital S Spirit, my Bible, which means you need to touch a God. You need to be born, ha- have that spiritual birth. Now, I'm not telling y'all anything you don't know, but this probably, that nuclear... Mushroom cloud in Nicodemus' eyes. Mind blown. He'd never thought about this before. He'd never thought about a spiritual birth. Um, Marvel not uh, that I said unto thee, you must be born again. Now this, he reiterates this statement, you must be born again. He's like, let me explain what I'm trying to tell you here, Nicodemus. And then he goes through the spiritual birth and he says, it's not as crazy as you were trying to make it out to be. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth, bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, 
and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. A lot of people use this verse, and this is another, this is like uh, out of context, part 2b. But a lot of people use this verse to talk about the Holy Spirit. You don't know where he's coming or where he's going. That's not what he's talking about here. <laughs> he's, talking about, he's talking about the spiritual birth. He's talking, he said, he said, he said the, the wind bloweth where it listeth. Now here's the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh or whither it goes. So is every one that is born of spirit. That means that it's not under your power to be born of spirit. That means it's not, also it's not something that's going to be evident from the outside of the physical body. When someone's born of the flesh, everybody knows about it. If you're present, you know, you really know about it, and then everybody's going to hear about it that's outside of that presentation. Everybody knows. But the spiritual birth is not necessarily like that. That's something that happens in here. That, that, that is an interaction between you and, quite literally, an invisible spiritual being. Something that we can't see with our own eyes. That's a point that needs to be brought up because the Jews are all about seeing things with their own eyes. In fact, if you look at, uh, I forget where it is in the New Testament, that it is brought out that it is blessed, blessed is he that, 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 that believes and doesn't see. That's a paraphrase. But then those that have, that have seen and believe. I believe he's talking to Thomas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, it's, but the Jews were always looking for a sign. They were always looking for evidence. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is go back to Gideon. Gideon's a perfect... Every time the, the idea of signs and the Jews is brought up, you just have to go to Gideon. Gideon needed like four of them before he <laughs> believed, that, believed that God would, would do what he said he would do. And that's just how they thought. They were... they uh, the, and, and maybe that is due to their history as well. Again, you have to think about who we're talking about. Jews who had seen physical manifestations of God on multiple occasions. The pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, uh, the angels fighting battles for them, suns standing still, uh, you, uh, they, 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 you, you see waters part, and uh, a, a guy that literally got so close to God that he glowed for the rest of his life. These physical manifestations of God, they'd seen them. That had been their interaction with God, and Jesus is presenting something totally different. This is going to be something that is more personal. That is not as, you know, we're going to shake the rocks of the world. It's going to be a still small voice. Let's continue. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Now, Nicodemus's next question is, I understand what you're saying, but I don't get it. I don't quite get it yet. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak what we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I had told you earthly things, and you, uh, uh, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Basically, he was saying, Nicodemus, I compared it the best way I know how to stuff terrestrial how are you going to believe stuff? If I get into like, like and this, if you ever look at salvation on the face of it, it's the most simplest thing, and, and I think it should be for the lost. It is, it is the most simple thing. But you really dig into the mechanics of salvation. It's like a face of a watch. You look at a watch, and it's it's simple. It's two hands. Some of them don't even have that. They just display numbers. It, it, it is a simple timepiece that tells you the time of day. You can glance at it and go on, but look underneath it. There's so much mechanics on there, and that's basically kind of the idea. It's not what he, Jesus would say, but the idea that Jesus is getting across. I've told you is a simple comparison to what you can understand as I can get. You're a master of Israel. And that wasn't saying, that. Oh, well, this is in the Scriptures. You should know that. No, he's saying, you're a very intelligent man, Nicodemus. I've I've compared this to the to the lowest common denominator. Peter, the fisher guy, gets this. <laughs> and you don't. If I can't get you to get the watch face, how am I going to turn the watch face over and show you the cogs on the inside? I, I you, you won't get it. Um uh and no man ha no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man which is in heaven. So he's also going to, Jesus is going to throw out his credentials here too. No man has been to heaven. Also, this is a very, for, and I have had some people say that they didn't believe in Abraham's bosom. This is a good verse to point out Abraham's bosom because no man 
had ascended to heaven. Nobody was dwelling with God at this time save the angels and only two-thirds of them. And he said his credentials were, no man's been to heaven but the Son of Man. I, me, I came from there. I know what I'm talking about. Let's continue. As uh, Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, Jesus makes a comparison. And I think verse 14 is a very important one to tie to, because a lot of people say, well, you need to go back to 15, or you need to go back to this. But 14 is a good one to start at if you're going to start breaking down what he's talking about. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Let's think about that scenario. Now he's going back to their Jewish heritage again. We're talking to a Jew. We have to go to something a Jew would understand, especially a ruler of the Jews, the brazen serpent. Moses, the people had sinned. They got snake bit for it, and all of them were going to die. Let me tell you, we Adam sinned. We got snake bit for it, and we're all going to die. Every single one of us. What was the form of salvation? Jesus said, take the form of the sin. Jesus took the form of a servant, take the form of the sin, raise it up. Everybody that looks on it, not only looks on it, but looks on it and believes, they'll be cured. That was their that 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 was the salvation. And not everyone did. The whosoever, when you tie it back to 14, because it all of Israel didn't go, yay, we're saved. There were doubters, and they died from snake bite poisoning. <laughs> and you know what? There are doubters who is systemically tied to who they are, who are dying from sin poisoning, and they will go to hell for it. Because the answer is right there. But they refuse to believe in it. Whether it is systemic here, or systemic here, or it's just how they are, that's not my problem. That's how they are. And, and, and when... He points out in, 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 uh, in verse 15, he says, Whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have eternal life. The whosoever there is not anybody and everybody. What he's talking about is that it doesn't matter if you're lame, if it doesn't matter if you're, uh, if you're, uh, if you're Jew, it doesn't matter if you're Greek, it doesn't matter if you're American, it doesn't matter, uh, and this is probably going to throw a lot of people, especially the ones that are, that are listening, it doesn't matter if you're gay, it doesn't matter if you whosoever believeth would be saved. That means it doesn't matter what you are before your salvation. It didn't matter who I was before it was salvation. It didn't matter who Brother Junior was. It didn't matter who Jarrett was. It doesn't, ma- it doesn't matter who Brother Larry was before his salvation. It, whosoever. Whosoever believeth would have eternal life. Then we get, for God so loved the world. Now this is the single part of it that gets taken out of context so much. Jesus loved everybody. No, he did not. Jesus was a member of the Godhead. God, had, at least in one place, said that he hated somebody. It's, the, it's one of the few places that he said he hated somebody, but he did say it. Yes, God created everyone. God created this world. Fact. God also has no problem in destroying it. Fact. He does not love everybody. He did not love everybody. And this goes back to our last lesson. He did not love everybody in Noah's time. And he does not love everyone now. He did, Jesus did not love everybody. The world. For God so loved everybody. And, and by what that that is what people take it to mean. But when he's talking about, remember, we're talking to a Jew. Jews don't believe in this time that anybody can be saved but them. And you know what? It wasn't just this time because all you have to do is look at the New Testament, the further New Testament, and Peter is trying to bring Judaism back into Christianity. Why? Because Jews assume we ha- we've always had the personal relationship with God. It's always been us. It's always been who we are. You must have to be circumcised because that's how you become a Jew, right? But that's not what that's not what Jesus says here. Jesus, in the privacy of this conversation with the Jewish man, says, "I don't care if you're Jew or Greek, because I love 
everybody of all nations and creeds, not everybody, every person that's ever been born. Because I love those, whosoever, whichever one of those people from those nations and creeds believes on me will be saved and have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And you say, well, here's more of those worlds. This is a perfect place for you to get thrown off. God didn't send His... And remember who we're talking to. This, this is the culmination here. This, this seals and locks it up, at least in my mind. God didn't send His Son in the world to make relationship with the Jews and condemn all the Greeks. God sent His Son into the world, into every nation and creed, so that every nation and creed might be saved. Through Him might be saved. Knowing that Nicodemus assumes that he is the elite, that his people are the elite, throws all, all doubt that this verse, you know, this verse would rail against election theology if you took it at its face. Everything that I just told you too, and I have done it in this class, and that's why I'm not looking it up today, but I have done this in my class before, all this is backed up by the Greek and the Hebrew that was written here. It, those words do not mean what you're talking about. It does not mean everybody. I'm sorry that it does not mean everybody, but also I'm not sorry because my God designed it that way. I don't understand why He designed it that way. And you know what? If Jesus had come to this earth to save everybody, He would have done it. That's the big thing. Jesus never lost one of His. In fact, He left the 90 and 9 and went and seeking the one. <laughs> and He found them. He's never lost one of His. So all these people that die and go to hell, does that mean his sacrifice was in vain? That's what you would have to take it to mean. But that doesn't jive with the rest of the scriptures. So our understanding, and this is the, the whole point of this out of context idea that I'm trying to bring to y'all, is this, our understanding has to change, the words don't change. What we think that we think that we know about this has to change, because if you put everything that I just told you into this context, every, all of a sudden, everything else falls right into place the way it's supposed to. Which means that the rest that, that there's no conflict in Scripture because there's never been a conflict in Scripture. There's conflict in language because, I'm sorry, we, we, this is a translation. This is not the original Word of God. This is our version of the Word of God in the best that we can do it. I believe in the 1611 King James, but I don't speak 1611 English, and I don't speak Greek and Hebrew, so I have to go back and I have to find what they meant. Because the words that they use, if we were to translate this directly right now, the Bible that we come out with in modern American English would probably be very a very, very weird version of the Word of God. Because the way that we talk now is not the way that we talked then. Because we w if we translated this directly, we wouldn't put, for God so loved everybody... No, that's not, that's not how, what we put there. God so loved every race, every color, every creed. We put something else there because that's what it means. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the, of the holy begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Your own actions, who you are, not necessarily what you are, is what is condemning you. You're a sinner because you're a sinner. You're born that way. You're, 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 you're everlastingly tied to that, separate and apart of Jesus' direct intervention. Which brings us back to the upper part of the chapter where I think Jesus led off with this, Jesus was a masterful teacher. Calling him rabbi was not necessarily a smack in the face. He was very, very skilled. Because this brings us back to his opening thought was, you have to be born of spirit. This has to be a direct interaction between you and God. Because the days, Nicodemus, of me saving an entire nation of people unto myself, they're over. They're over. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds be reproved. But he that doeth truth, uh, that doeth truth, 
uh, cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, and that they are wrought of God. Now, this kind of ends this discourse. After this, he goes into uh, into Judea, and we start talking about uh, 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 John baptizing and stuff like that, which I don't think is related to the upper part of the chapter. Uh, but for our idea, this this is it. This is it. We we cannot and and we 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 have we have to study better. We have we have to do a better job uh, because when we take a single out of anywhere and and, and it's not just John three sixteen it, you know which is I think one of the more commonly out of context but if we just flip through the Bible and say you know what I'm going to teach on this first because it seems to facilitate my way of thinking. That's just as bad as saying that God, that Jesus came in here to save the world. We can prevent ourselves from doing that just with a little time investment, a little research. Make sure you know what you're talking about because I brought this up kind of the top of class. There are people watching. We don't know who's watching. Probably some unsaved people. There are people in this room that are unsaved. There are people in this room that, that are Christians that are eating the meal that you're preparing and it's spoiled it's gone bad because you put in, instead of adding you know three cups of sugar you put three cups of salt and that's not going to taste real great when the cake comes out we have we we we, we have to take and, and and i think this and this this is not something that i think we take out of context very often but i think when it comes to these these places where we say well there's there's conflict here there's there's there, there is no conflict there, 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 there is the there, there. There's a lack of study. There, there's, there's, uh, because there are better verses to to say that to to do this out. This is not a good to me, not a good salvation message chapter. There are so many other chapters in the New Testament where you can present the Word of God. To me, the to me, one of the best ones is either the Ethiopian eunuch or uh, the Philippian jailer. Just pure raw. Witnessing and belief and humble grieving of a lost person. It doesn't get any more real than those passages, in my opinion. Just one man, one on one. And I guess in Paul and Silas' situation, it was two. But uh, uh, but you know, you you just you have these intimate inter- interactions because that that's how it happens. That it, it, belief is necessary for salvation and. We've gone through salvation so much, so much in this class that uh, I don't think it needs to be said. But the idea that is derived from this verse that anybody can be saved that that all you all you have to do is believe on Jesus, and, and really what they're saying is, do you think that Jesus was real? That's not. I mean, you ask a a, a child, do they think the Easter Bunny's real? And if they've been taught all their life that he's real, of course they're going to say whatever you want to say to them. And we're and, and every day there are children, and, and not even just children, adults, that are being sent to eternal condemnation with the full belief that I'm saved. Off of out-of-context stuff like this right here. That should push us to be, be a little bit... Do your sword drills, and not not the not the Bible game where you. Uh, if we're warriors and this is our weapon, you have to practice every day. Knights spent hours of practice every day. You want to know why? Because a sword in medieval times and in this time weighed about twenty twenty five pounds of steel out in front of you. If you didn't practice with it, boom, on the ground, and you would tire quickly. Sloppy shots, and a well-trained knight slaps your sword out of the way and cuts you down on the battlefield. And I think that's where we end up a lot of time. We, we, it, it, I see these Facebook wars. I'm kind of over that stuff, but uh, where where people throw out these sloppily made arguments based on a series of verses that are unrelated to what they're what they're trying to say, and all it takes is somebody that with with a modicum of skill greater than theirs to cast their argument aside. And then you're left there looking like you're unlearned, and uh, uh, you know, and, and and heaven help you if that happens in a witness situation, you've just lost the battle. 
If your weapon that you're using to do warfare for God is knocked aside, what else do you have to work with? You're going to turn tail and run. You don't have anything else. This is important, people. Study is important. All right, we're going to continue possibly with this. If not, we'll come back to it at some other time with uh, Out of Context. Does anybody have any questions or comments on today's reading? Uh, Sister Donna, you had your hand up first, then we'll go to you, Brother Jarrett. You have to go through. You have to go through travail. Yeah. Well, I mean, human lives don't come by easy, and, and spiritual lives shouldn't either. Somebody that can just say a little prayer and then, oh, I'm saved. You have to wonder. <laughs> you have you have to wonder. It's like uh, the. There was no crying. There was no, uh, and I'm not saying that, but but that I'm not saying emotion is everything. But that emotional breakdown on you like chicken pox when you got when you have them. I mean, they're, they're gonna pop all over you like and, and 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 tears and weeping and even joy are all part of that. But if you don't see it, it's a little odd. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yep. G- Jesus. Jesus. Ha- well, also this this brings out a you know there was a uh, if God if I think if there had been a way Jesus would have snapped his fingers and everybody had been saved. But the idea of him going to the cross that it had to be that way. There we were tunneling toward that. If you look at the scriptures and probably in Jared's class, we could see some of this. We were tunneling toward this for thousands of years. We were making it. He had to. He had to live. He had to die, and he had to be lifted up. He had. He had to be a public display of shame and death and bleeding and carnage, so that people could be saved. There, there was no other way to do it. And Jesus asked just to make sure at the Garden of Eden. <laughs> let if, if it if, let this cup pass from me, but not my will. <laughs> uh, Brother Jarrett. There you go. Yep. Uh, some people, and 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 the, the, I think that to me, the idea that God selected a certain people does not boggle my mind because he 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 had been doing that for a long time. The part of it that it all that is always tough to me about election is that there's just some people that can't. And that's sad, and it's hard, and it's beyond my idea. Because if I was God, and I'm not, if and I, I would have tried to get everybody. But that's just not the that's just not His way. And I don't understand why it's not His way. But He gets as much glory out of vessels of wrath as He does vessels of honor, and because He creates both. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but where? Well, in another verse it shows it can't be lodged and he's saying that the devil's the way we tremble. Yeah. Yeah. Important words, important verses. Stay studied up. 